We built an actual forehand mid X20 and we had a great time doing it. But there's a new improved version coming out. QRP kits as a bit X20A and we're going to build one of those. We ordered our kit from QRPkits.com and eagerly awaited the day that it arrived. It arrived this way in a nice box and after just a couple days it came real quickly. Inside we have the kit. We have some loose diodes that aren't packaged. I would assume those are probably the, the mixer diodes. And we have a pack that contains the circuit board and all the parts. So rather than just rip this open right away and start scattering parts all over, I'm going to get something to keep them in so that everything will at least stay in one place. You probably expected something fancy. Well, if you had a nice uh, parts cabinet that you could separate them all out and catalog them, that would be the ultimate. But I didn't. So what I have here is a, a lid off of a box of copier paper. It'll keep everything organized. I can spread it out, parts out a little bit, so I'll be able to find them and best of all is none will escape underneath the oscilloscope or on the floor or wherever parts happen to disappear to. It's got nice vertical edges so the parts can't just walk off on their own. They can't climb up those straight sides. First side I'm going to open on this because it's in two packets. I'm going to open the side with the board in it so we can look at the old versus the new. I didn't cut my finger, which is good. I want to show bloodshed on the on the screen. So there, there's the new board. High quality, looks great, and it's not very big. Let's compare it to the Far Circuits board, which is the one that I built last time. This is the original bit X here with the Far Circuits board and back here in the back is the RF amplifier board and the main transceiver board here. So we can see the power line so they travel along those cable lines that pretty thick. We can see the difference in circuit board size. Not only is this a lot smaller, it's about less than half the size. It's going to put out twice the power. This is going to put out 10 to 12 watts where this particular RF amplifier board back here, I'm, I'm running about 4 watts with mine. Some of them go 5, 6 watts. So this should be a really interesting and, and we'll compare it circuit-wise and signal-wise as we do the build. In the background you can hear signal on the 20 meters well until they just switched over. So radio does work. We expect this one to work better. Before we start melting solder, to be successful in building this kit or most kits, or most construction projects even, you need a few basic tools. Particularly for this kit, you need a small tip soldering iron. This has got a real fine point because the pads on this bo circuit board are pretty small. So this is temperature controlled small soldering iron. This station I think cost about $40. They're relatively inexpensive if you find the right place. The other thing you'll need is a few basic hand tools. I like to use full flush cut pliers. If you look, these cut flat. So we can take a look at the jaws on them. See, they're tapered on this side, but they they're, have a flat, sharp side on this other side. So they'll cut a nice flat lead. These are relatively inexpensive also. You can usually find them, buy them at uh, electronics catalogs for five, six, seven dollars a piece. You'll need a pair of needle nose pliers just for moving things around and positioning things. For lead bending I like to use these. These are 
fully round nose pliers. These are made for bending leads, forming leads, so that we can make the nice round bends on the end of the resistors. Other thing is solder. Most of you probably have soldered. It's very similar to this. This is .031 solder and it works great for most general purpose jobs but this that's a problem going to be a problem for this kit you can use it but you're always going to end up with too much solder on a connection probably the thing that determines the amount of solder that ends up on a connection is when you heat the solder you're going to get a drop of solder will melt and come off all at once the size of that drop is determined by the diameter of the solder so with .031 solder you're going to get a lot of solder no matter what you try to do. I like this for building circuit boards. This is .015. So if you look at the difference, it's one half the size. And you probably, I don't know if you can see that. I don't know if you can see the difference in size there, but the one on the right to half the size of the one on the left, and that's just a real nice size solder to work with. It's really hard to find though. If you go to Radio Shack, you'll never find it. This is also 6337 solder, which is what they call also eutectic solder. The other solder there is 6040. That's, the numbers refer to the tin lead ratio. 6337 solder, a eutectic solder, melts at 361 degrees. It's the coolest melting solder there is. So if we work with that, it will melt sooner, so we'll end up putting less heat on the circuit board and the components. The other advantage is it has no plastic stage. Most solders have a state whether they're neither liquid or solid. So with eutectic solder it goes instantly from liquid to, to solid so you don't get any cold solder joints or it's hard to get a cold solder joint with it. The other thing you might that you need is some kind of board holder. I happen to have a fancy one but uh, Doug on his website uh, qrpkits.com has a a PC board vise that he sells real reasonable. The other way you could go would be with something like this. Doug's is a whole lot cheaper than that one though. So with these basic tools we should be ready to start our assembly. Before you could get started there's three other things you need. You need to download the step-by-step -step instruction manual that'll tell you what part to place and when. You need the component placement diagram. You can lo also load that off the website. And you need the schematic. So with those three items, the circuit board, parts, and the tools, you should be all set to begin your construction. Once we open the parts bag, we find that the parts are individually packaged also. The resistors and pots are in one sealed section of the bag. Most of the capacitors are in another one. These are probably the point ones. I'd have to look because this kit uses a bunch of them for feed-through capacitors. And then we have the hardware, the transformers, heat sinks, transistors, and the ferrite cores for winding the transformers. So we'll open them up and then we're ready to start. If you're fairly new to building, one thing you need to watch is polarity of the capacitors. It says plus there. 
that's got a big bar and minus down to that lead. And also on this particular capacitor, the minus, shortest lead is the minus lead. So I'm not going to bore you with a step-by-step -step component by component install. I'm going to install some components and whenever I think there's something that you should see, we'll stop and I'll show you. Just one quick note about installing parts. When you place the parts of the board, hold them tight with your finger, or actually just hold them there in place. Turn the board over. It's easier with my board holder. Hold while the board, while the components are tight against the board, pull on the lead a little bit and pull it out about a 45 degree angle. So you pull, and if you pull while you're doing that, the component will end up nice and tight on the board. A really good tool for you to have if you're going to do some home brewing is this LC meter 2B from almost all digital electronics. That makes it real easy. We can just hook up to our capacitor here now and then we can read the value. This is reading 0.095 microfarad, so that's our 0.1 microfarad capacitors. These are available. You can look up almost all digital electronics on the internet. These are about $100. They really work great for inductance too. I have the first four parts installed on the board. They're not soldered. Next thing it calls out is to install the IC. Well, I'm going to install the IC in the socket because I don't like to have to remove ICs off the of circuit boards because it's hard to do to, without damaging the board sometimes. So you want to use a socket. I don't normally use a socket like this. I'd usually use a machine pin socket. This is just a cheap socket. So what I'm going to use instead, which is uses a similar pins as a machine pin socket, is one of these sockets like this. Now I only need four pins but on each side, but that's not a problem to do. What's nice on these sockets is that they have real nice plug-in spring contacts to hold the wire leads. So we'll use eight pins off of this one and then we'll be able to just plug the IC in. The disadvantages to using this type of socket will be I don't have any pin one indicator but we can see right on the board. We have the notch silk screened on the board so it won't be a problem as far as getting the IC in wrong. I have my socket installed on the board now. I just bent out the other pins that I weren't using. Now when I solder that what I'll do is I'll solder one corner while I'm putting a little pressure on so that it'll be held in place tight on the board. Then once I've got all the pins soldered then I can remove the aluminum carrier. There are the sockets all soldered in place and has the carrier removed. It's all set to go. Next we'll plug the IC into it. C79 called for a .022 microfarad capacitor and I didn't find one that was marked so I got looking at the green ones here and it looks like one of these green green one like that so if your kit's like mine you should have a green one it's kind of oddball from everything else and it's .022 microfarad Well, stage one's done. I'm all set to do the transmitter AF amplifier coming up next. So this looks like a good time to take a break. We've got a lot accomplished. We've got to begin anyway. So we're started. And the next section will finish up enough to where we can power it up 
and actually make some test measurements. When you're building yours, don't be in a hurry. If you get in a hurry, you get careless and you make mistakes. It's a lot easier to do it right the first time than to find the problem after you create it. 